Well, good, good morning. It's great to be here uh, in South Calgary with uh, my colleagues, Minister Taze and Sonny, to highlight a huge tax cut for Albertans today with the elimination of Alberta's fuel tax that's going to save uh, 13 cents per litre. And that's big money when Albertans need it most. We are living through 30-year high inflation. And uh, inflation is nearly six points a year. Food inflation, 18 points since they brought in the carbon tax back in 2015. And Alberta's government has listened to Albertans saying that we need to take real action uh, to reduce the cost of living. So at midnight last night, we did exactly that with uh, a suspension of the 13 cent a liter Alberta fuel tax. Uh, last night, gas at this station here in uh, McLeod Trail South was selling at 167.99. And what are we at right now? 156.6. So a 11.3 cent savings. Now, the problem is that that includes the 3 cent a liter increase from the Liberal NDP carbon tax. Uh, so, uh, you know, we fought against that. We sued the feds all the way to the Supreme Court. Regrettably, we lost. We just passed a motion in Alberta's legislature calling on the feds not to uh, raise the uh, carbon tax today on April Fool's Day, but they ignored us because they want to punish Canadians for filling up their gas tanks, heating their homes, turning on the electricity, and living normal lives. But by contrast, Alberta's government is taking real action to save people money, to put more jingle in their jeans, to let them keep more of their hard-earned cash. In fact, province-wide, last night, gas prices in Alberta were averaging a, a buck, a 165, I should say, and today they're averaging 154. Now, by the way, the uh, NDP in Alberta that had been cheering on the Trudeau carbon tax hike uh, said that retailers like this would chisel Albertans and wouldn't pass on uh, the government's tax savings. Well, that has not happened. They were wrong. Once again, they were attacking the businesses, many of these small uh, of these uh, gas retailers, these gas stations are owned by mom and pop, family owned businesses. And of course they're gonna pass on the savings. We'll keep a close eye on that. But the good news is this, while Albertans are saving a whole lot at the pumps, uh, people in the rest of the country are not. In Ontario, I understand that gas prices are up six cents over last night. That's the effect of the liberal NDP carbon tax hike. But here in Alberta, we're seeing the benefit of this uh, pausing the suspension of the provincial fuel tax. It will be in place as long as we benefit from high oil prices north of um, 180, uh, sorry, I should say $80 a barrel per WTI. And that protects our budget as well, because we know that as long as WTI is trading at north of 80 bucks a barrel, that our finances will be in balance. So we are not going to take more money out of people's pockets if we don't need it to maintain a balanced budget in Alberta. Let me just put this in perspective. This uh, 13 cent a liter savings being delivered by Alberta's government today is worth on an annual basis, should it carry on for the next 12 months, it would be worth $1.4 billion. $1.4 billion in tax savings, that's real money. Uh, by comparison, the Liberal NDP carbon tax is taking more than $2 billion out of people's pockets. So this goes a long way to repairing the damage of the Liberal NDP carbon tax, but it's not all. In addition, this spring, Alberta electricity consumers will be getting a $150 rebate on their power bills as soon as the power companies can put that through, and that amounts to another $300 million of savings. So on an annual basis, that's $1.7 billion dollars of consumer savings uh, by action taken by Alberta's government uh, and that's nearly as much as the Liberal NDP carbon tax is taking out of people's pockets. But the real problem is they don't intend to stop today with their 25 percent increase in the carbon tax. Uh, the sky is the limit for these guys and they're planning to raise it by at least another 400 percent uh, from the current $50 a barrel, uh, sorry, $50 a ton They've admitted they're going to at least a $170 a ton carbon tax. And Environment Canada, in a leaked study three years ago, projected that for the feds to hit their emissions targets through punishing consumers would require a carbon tax of upwards of $400 a ton, nearly a tenfold increase.
from where we're at now. So today, uh, the Liberal NDP carbon tax is already taking about $600 uh, uh, a year out of the pockets of hardworking families. So actually, that was based on yesterday's $40 price. Uh, and uh, they're going to be taking $2,000 a year out of the pockets of hardworking families who are struggling to pay their bills with today's record inflation once they get it up to their $170 price. And if they stay in power and keep jacking up those carbon taxes as their ridiculous um, NEP 2.0 plan would suggest, uh, then hold on to your seatbelts because you won't be able to afford uh, filling up a gas at the gas tank, let alone heating your homes, turning on the power, or just going to buy groceries. It's important to remember this is not just about people who drive. This is not just about motorists. Um, everything you get at the grocery store is brought in by a truck, and every one of those trucks has to pay for diesel. Today we also reduce the price of diesel, and we also reduce the price of marked fuel uh, for our farmers who are uh, struggling to cope with record high input costs. So the, pretty much the price of everything that you buy is affected by these gas taxes and these carbon taxes. And that's why Alberta's government is on the side of ordinary people in uh, pausing the Alberta uh, gas tax today and providing additional relief to come. And with that, I'm going to invite Minister Taze and Minister Sani to add a few more remarks. Well, thank you, Premier, and, and good morning. Today marks the beginning of a new approach that brings relief uh, to Albertans when they're challenged by high energy costs. Starting today, Alberta's government will phase out the fuel tax when the price of oil is above $80 a barrel and will no longer collect fuel tax when the price of oil is above $90 a barrel. This move saves Albertans 13 cents on every litre of gas and diesel they purchase, leaving more money in their pockets. Since we tabled the province's 2022 budget in February, the world has changed considerably. Global realities are impacting Albertans directly as inflation pressures continue to drive up the cost of living. Prices have increased everywhere from the grocery store to the gas station, meaning Albertans are paying more for everyday goods they and their families need. We recognize the significance of the challenges Albertans are facing, and by pausing the collection of the fuel tax, we're making life in Alberta more affordable. Even before today, our fuel prices were already lower on average than the rest of the country. And now, as a result of the government's action, the cost of living and doing business in Alberta decreases even further. For instance, a family, whether they're driving to soccer practice, a dance recital, a 4-H achievement day, or another event, can now expect to save anywhere between $7 in a compact car or smaller SUV to upwards of $20 in a larger pickup truck every time they fill up at the pump. Businesses, municipalities will also reap the benefits, particularly through savings compounded and spread over fleets of vehicles. But the impact of the relief measure will be felt far beyond the gas station. Businesses will be relieved of cost pressures associated with transported goods such as groceries, clothing, and other essential items. In turn, reducing the need for them to increase prices for Alberta consumers. These are real savings that will have a real effect on Albertans and their ability to make ends meet. With high energy prices and responsible fiscal management, we have the ability to provide meaningful tax relief. We'll use this new fiscal flexibility to erase cost pressures felt by Albertans and Alberta businesses. We'll revisit the tax relief measure quarterly, but in the meantime, we commend Albertans for their resilience in the face of adversity and affirm this government's commitment to ensuring our province remains among the country's most affordable. Thank you. And now I would like to call on Minister Sawney for some remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Minister Taze, and thank you, Premier Kenny. And thank you for this very important program to ease the pain at the pump. The skyrocketing cost of gas hurts all of us, including those businesses that transport our goods, services, and keep our province moving. The cost of fuel is a major expense for these companies as they move goods across great distances to keep our shelves stocked with the products that we need 
and that we depend on. We need to do everything we can to support the trucking industry, especially during this time of supply chain issues and a shortage of drivers. By eliminating the provincial tax at the pump, we estimate about half of the $1.4 billion in savings being passed on to Albertans, or about $670 million, will be saved by commercial operators in 2022, 23, should the price of oil remain at current levels. Practically speaking, for an owner-operator of a tractor-trailer in the province, this translates to quarterly savings of approximately $700. We know that this doesn't solve all the challenges Albertans are facing regarding the rising cost of living or operating a business, but this is one of the ways our government is finding ways to provide relief. It will keep trucks on the road. It will help keep Albertans employed and it will help those who drive for a living with some much needed relief with the price of a tank of gas. Thank you again, Premier Kenny and Minister Taze for eliminating the provincial fuel tax, not only for our commercial drivers, but for all Albertans. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. With that, we're gonna start, we're gonna go to questions. We're gonna start in person here. So when you come up to the mic, please identify who you are, your outlet, your name, and uh, here, directing your question to, we'll go with one question and one follow-up. Go ahead. Uh, Josh Aldridge, Calgary Herald, uh, Post Media. This is for uh, Mr. Tays. So the price today, 156.6, price yesterday, 167.9. But in the last two days, WTI has dropped by $8 a barrel. I think a lot of people are looking at that and saying, well, is there really a savings that's being passed on or is this just also part of the cost of WTI dropping by $8 over the last two days? I know it's fluctuated quite a bit, but what reassurance is there that that's not just where this is coming from, uh, that this is just from uh, the drop in the provincial sales tax? Sure, sure. So, so there are, as you point out, a lot of a lot of factors that go into the retail price of fuel, but the fuel that is being sold today was an inventory. So the the, the fuel that is being sold to, uh, today this morning uh, really has no bearing on any WTI price changes last night or even yesterday or perhaps even last week. There's a delay from the time uh, the uh, WTI price changes, oil prices change, and the time that inventory gets it ultimately into the tanks of retailers. So we, we've done a scan across the province and uh, we're very confident that retailers have, uh, have passed along really all of the tax savings to consumers based on what we're seeing today. So if there... Yeah, the proof of that is gas prices are up by six cents a litre in Ontario. So the same global energy price trends, but the di totally different local retail prices. Uh, so you don't see... Ontarians saving anything on a recent reduction in WTI, you do see them being punished by the Trudeau carbon tax hike and Albertans benefiting from the lower, um, the, the lower fuel taxes. Go ahead with your follow-up. All right, my follow-up. This just to kind of clear up on my end a little bit. So our, previously did the province charge the provincial sales tax on wholesale fuel charge to, or that was sold to the uh, to the different distributors uh, and if so when did the province stop charging that to the distributor to the places like sure. touch or co-op like where we're at now uh, because if they're able to drop today by 13 cents on that when did that leg yeah. kick in for them yeah so so f firstly it's not a provincial sales tax it's a fuel tax that, that's what and, and 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 secondly uh, we had our department uh, implemented uh, a refund basically a tax refund uh, program so that retailers could get a refund uh, on the tax that they had on inventory on hand that allowed them to immediately adjust their prices uh, today and drop their price by 13 cents a liter or more thank you next question Hi, Rachel Manuel with the Western Standard. Uh, my question is for Premier Jason Kenney. Uh, Premier, new challenges to your leadership have emerged with Danielle Smith announcing that she'd be interested in the top job. Uh, what do you make of this? And do you consider her a kook as you called your other opponents as well? Perhaps you could address some of the comments from the Unite Alberta Twitter page saying only those who have a track record of losing have all the answers. So, uh, look, my focus is on making life better for Albertans. I'm here today uh, underscoring 1.7 billion dollars of relief for consumers 
while we continue to fight the Liberal NDP carbon tax. So I'm not going to be distracted by uh, voices of division. I'm focused on, as I always have been, uniting the Conservative movement. With respect to Kooks, you know perfectly well uh, that I was referring to people who have uh, threatened my life, those of my colleagues, that of my 83-year-old mother. I specifically was referring to people, for example, someone who posted on my Facebook that quotes were coming for you, Kenny, on April 9th, we are taking you and your corrupt government down. You and the Jew-loving Great Reset tyrants are headed for the Nuremberg trial. People who accused me of engaging with Walmart in trafficking children as part of a conspiracy with the World Economic Forum. Uh, people who have been disqualified as conservative candidates because they said that uh, in one case, uh, in the case of Todd Beasley, uh, is Muslims are fools who are really worshipping Satan and Islam is not a religion of peace, it's a cruel, revolting, racist, oppressive religion and has no legitimate basis, that the Mongols should have snuffed out the Muslims when they had the chance. People like a, another candidate who was disqualified for agreeing, uh, for reposting on, online that quotes, Islam is a death cult. People that organized a tiki, tiki torch parade at the legislature using images from the notorious 2017 neo-Nazi Klux Klan uh, tiki torch parade in Charlottesville, Virginia. People that left a noose on the home of one of our MLA's uh, front lawns threatening uh, her life implicitly. People who hammered on the doors of our health minister, Jason Copping, uh, while his teenage uh, children were at home screaming that he was a mass murderer for promoting uh, vaccine usage. People who attacked our former health minister, Tyler Shandra, and his young children, saying that he would be executed for his, quotes, crimes against humanity. Uh, these are the people that I've characterized as kooks because they are kooks. Um, now moving on to COVID measures, has your government begun reintroducing COVID measures um, with a new concern about one of the variants? And if so, will you wait for your leadership review to be over to reintroduce such measures? Uh, let me just come back to the last question. Uh, what I have said is, as long as I'm the leader of the United Conservative Party, I will not permit a rerun of the, uh, the Lake of Fire incident. Um, a, a Conservative Party was blown out in an election in 2011 because of a failure of leadership to block extremists from getting on the party ballot. Uh, that is a lesson that I thought people would have learned as long as I'm leading this party, it will be a mainstream conservative party. And I welcome voices who disagree with me on a whole range of policy issues. Always have, always will. We've demonstrated greater openness and tolerance for uh, dissenting views in our caucus and party than any that I could, I've, I've ever seen because we are a grassroots democratic party. But um, there has to be a limit. And for me, the limit has always been a commitment to our members that we will not tolerate a hateful extremism that promotes uh, violence or uh, hateful views towards entire categories of people. Uh, in terms of COVID, uh, what my ob I observe that I'm doing okay with the audio here. Are we cutting out? Okay, I'll just keep proceeding. Um, with respect to COVID, yeah, why don't I try the other mic here? Thanks. So, uh, as I've said before, I believe that the worst of COVID is behind us. Uh, that would uh, be the evidence from around the world um, with a much higher degrees of population protection and less severe variants. Uh, we are seeing other jurisdictions hit by the Omicron BA2 uh, subvariant wave that have been able to maintain uh, zero public health restrictions uh, because, the, because, again, of high levels of population protection and uh, less virulence. So uh, the only exception to that would be a couple of Asian jurisdictions, uh, including China, which have resorted back to lockdown-style policies, and that would be partly because of much lower levels of vaccination amongst their elderly population, as well as the much lower levels of efficacy of the um, Sinovax. In addition, those countries that had pursued a zero COVID policy have very low levels of natural immunity in their population. But when you look to European jurisdictions like the United Kingdom, 
uh, the Scandinavian countries, many Western European countries, that have gone into a BA2 wave. None of them have introduced new public health measures. None of them have had to. The pressures on their hospitals are manageable. And so I have every reason to believe that that will be the experience here in Alberta and in Canada. Go ahead, Tim. Tim Broco, CTV. Um, I just want to go back to the, those kooks comments again. You have mentioned those people a number of times now. Uh, Danielle Smith says she is, is uh, I guess, determined. Okay. <laughs> you don't need to hear it anyway. Um, <laughs> Danielle Smith says she's determined to unite the party. You know, she would argue that those people aren't kooks, or the large majority of those people, rather. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of that strategy that she says she kind of wants to reunite the United Conservative Party? Well, I'll just say this. My commitment from day one has been uh, to lead a united mainstream Alberta Conservative Party, within which there's always going to be a range of views and a bunch of questions. Uh, and, uh, but there are obviously limits. And for me, the limit is if you uh, profoundly hate, you're not welcome in the United Conservative Party, period, full stop. Uh, in fact, that was the marching orders that our members gave me when I spent three years crisscrossing the province in this truck uh, with the building the unity, building the United Conservative Party. What I heard from our members every, in every corner of Alberta was this. Never again let a lake of fire incident happen. Never again allow extremism like that to make this party unelectable. Those are my art marching orders. Uh, that's why we excluded a bunch of applicants to be candidates in our party in the last election, including people who had expressed vile kinds of hatred towards entire categories of people. So if, uh, you know, I, and I believe that the vast majority of our members agree with me on that, and they want a stable, sound, responsible leadership uh, that will maintain a big tent, a mainstream conservative party, no space in it for extremists who hate people. Go ahead with your follow-up. Um, Smith now is the second person that said that she wants your job. Uh, if you do come out the other side of this leadership review, is anything going to change uh, as far as Jason Kenney is concerned to make sure that these people don't keep on cropping up from within your own party? Well, our members will decide, and I, I'm, I've always welcomed that. I think it's important to have accountability, and uh, so we'll have a, a universal ballot of all the UCP members uh, in the month of April. And uh, from based on what I'm hearing as I uh, travel across the province, I'm very encouraged by what I'm hearing from our members who appreciate that our government has kept nearly 90% of our platform commitments, that we have balanced the budget, we have defended choice in education, uh, we are reducing the cost of living on Albertans, we are leading Canada in economic growth, we are seeing a, a whole new era of diversification, uh, and we are standing up for a strong Alberta. I, what I'm hearing, I was just yesterday in Medicine Hat, in the last week, I've been from Lac La Biche and Smoky Lake, Athabasca, um, Spruce Grove, St. Albert, Edmonton, Calgary, Red Deer, Lacombe, Medicine Hat, right across the province. And what I'm hearing is tremendous encouragement, uh, but ultimately the members will, will get their say, and uh, I, for one, will certainly respect the decision that they make. We'll take one more in person, then we'll go to the phones. Go ahead. Uh, Tom Ross, City News. Uh, first off, in reference to uh, the carbon tax, the federal carbon tax, how pleased are you to see the rebate go up as well? Well, as you know, the Parliamentary Budget Officer has confirmed that despite the rebate, 60% of Canadian households pay more in the carbon tax than they get in the rebate. So I'm not pleased at all. I'm not pleased with this fiscal shell game that also constitutes a huge transfer of wealth from rural people in particular to urban people. I think that's unfair. Uh, rural people, uh, rural life is in many, many ways more expensive, it's certainly more energy intensive. People can't take the bus to work off the farm. And so just as our farmers are coping with record high input costs, they're now getting whacked with a carbon tax that makes a rural life even more expensive. And they're definitely big losers in the uh, Trudeau uh, carbon tax shell game. In addition, it's a big loss for small businesses. They don't get a rebate, but they have to pay the carbon tax to heat their operation. It's a huge loss for small businesses, or sorry, uh, community nonprofits. On um, Saturday last, I was at a small community center in North Calgary, 
And the director came up to me to say that, that they were having to spend, the volunteer director said they were having to spend several hundred dollars a month on carbon tax, but they're in a low income area, they can't raise their membership fees, they get no rebate. And she said, if this goes up by another 400%, we'll probably have to shut, cl close the place down and hand the keys over to the city. So I'm not at all happy with these fake rebates when in fact what this is, is a, a deliberate policy to increase the cost of living and punish people for living normal lives. Uh, that's why we'll continue to fight the Liberal NDP carbon tax every step of the way. Tom, I'm just going to stop you for a second. We're, we're just going to switch out your microphone again. Premier. Yeah, no problem. Good. Go, go Good. ahead. All right. Uh, and then, uh, ideally, from all three of you, I'd like to hear a response on uh, insurance rates. I know uh, I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that. You know, I pay a whole lot more in car insurance than I do in gas. So, what can you do, ideally, in the short term, to cut down on those insurance rates? Well, thank you. Uh, and insurance rates have uh, gone up in recent years for a number of reasons. One of which was uh, the uh, a number of, of insurance companies were pulling out of the Alberta market, which meant less competition. But we have seen uh, a number of those companies reduce their rates in the past uh, year. Those have been approved, and I'll invite Minister Taze to say more about that. Sure, thanks, Premier. And, and uh, absolutely, we've seen uh, over the last probably four to five years uh, an escalation in automobile insurance premiums. And, uh, that escalation has been driven by real costs uh, in, in the automobile sector, costs related to um, you know, more costly repairs on, uh, to, to repair cars and vehicles as those vehicles become more expensive, more technologically advanced. Uh, we've seen uh, those costs rise as well uh, due to uh, bodily injury claims and, and the resulting litigation and all, of, all that that entails. So that's why we uh, introduced and passed Bill 41 last year, which <clears throat> ultimately uh, resulted in, in additional health benefits for injured Albertans uh, that, that are injured in, in a traffic accident, but also it clarified the definition of a minor injury. And that clarification, uh, which was patterned after some other provinces, has, uh, has uh, actually reduced costs in the system. And I'm really pleased to report that over the last 12 months, we've actually seen a decline on average in terms of automobile insurance rates in the province with some insurers dropping their premiums by as much as 7%. We're watching it, we're monitoring it. We want to deal with the systemic issues that are actually driving up the cost of insurance. Thank you, Minister Taze and, and Premier. And uh, Minister Taze has clearly and succinctly outlined the causes for increases in, insur in insurance rates and what we are doing. All I can say to add to that is I've clearly heard from my stakeholders, from truckers, from taxi drivers, for anybody who is in uh, fleet driving positions about uh, insurance issues and certainly we have taken a closer look at it and Minister Taze has also been in discussions with some of these stakeholders as well. But again, he has clearly outlined what we are doing as government to ensure that the insurance file is appropriately looked at. Thank you. And with that, we're going to go to the phones. Operator, can you please put through our first caller? Amanda Anderson, CTV. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I believe uh, best suited for the Premier. Um, I'm just wondering if you can um, tell us again how uh, the government plans to monitor uh, the rebate at the pumps and um, if there is stations that aren't following it, uh, how will it be enforced? Sure, well you're going to get Minister Taves here um, uh, for, for this answer, at least initially. So uh, a, a couple of things. Firstly, uh, there is a very competitive retail market in Alberta for, for fuel, for gas and diesel. And it was our belief that because of that very competitive market that um, ultimately retailers would be passing uh, this tax savings along to consumers. And of course, we're seeing that today. 
uh, in terms of price adjustments from yesterday uh, to today. We'll continue to monitor it. And again, I have every reason to believe that in this competitive market, retailers will be, in fact, uh, passing these savings on. It, it's, of course, there are many factors that, uh, that go into the retail price of fuel. Obviously, the price of oil, uh, refining margins as well, a transportation basis uh, differentials, uh, as well as retail margins. But uh, again, we've got a very competitive environment in Alberta, and I believe consumers will benefit, will be monitoring it. Go ahead with your follow-up. So uh, if they don't, let's say, I mean, we, we all hope they do, but if they don't, are there consequences? So again, we'll, we'll cross that bridge uh, when we get to it. I, I, I'm confident that, that retailers will be passing uh, these savings on to consumers. Uh, he, here's the reality. If we have two or three retailers that are consistently passing these tax savings on in a very competitive environment with small margins, which is really what our retailers deal with here in the province, Ultimately, those who don't pass along the savings won't be selling gas. That, that will be the reality. And so, again, we'll be monitoring it. I'm very confident in, in our competitive retail market. Thanks, Minister. Brady, can you put there our next caller? Carly Robertson, TV News. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm trying to get, uh, get an understanding of next steps with COVID-19 in Alberta. We're seeing wastewater data showing an increase, particularly in large cities. And uh, Premier, you, you spoke a little bit about that natural immunity, but in the UK, we're seeing reports of lots of people becoming reinfected with COVID-19. So I'm wondering what is Alberta doing right now and what is the potential next step? Thank you. So we are monitoring the situation very closely and we can fully expect future waves, uh, that's a certainty. Uh, but the experience of other jurisdictions around the world that have been hit by this uh, BA2 uh, wave of Omicron is that it has not overwhelmed their hospitals and none of them have brought back uh, public health restrictions, at least not in Europe. Uh, and those are countries that have similar levels of population protection, both um, through vaccinations and natural immunity as we do here in Alberta. So that, that gives uh, me good reason to believe that uh, like those European countries, uh, we can get through future waves as uh, population protection continues to grow and the uh, uh, severity of these variants continues to decline. Um, we'll watch it very closely. I guess the one thing I would, uh, the most important thing that people could do to protect themselves from this and any future waves would be to get a booster shot. So only about half of people who got a second vaccination shot in Alberta have gone on to get that third shot, that booster. And uh, it, the best thing that they could do to protect themselves and our healthcare system would be to step up and get the third shot because the evidence suggests that's very uh, effective at uh, preventing severe outcomes. So once again, um, look, Omicron excuse me, I should say COVID-19 is going to be with us for the rest of our lives. Uh, COVID-19 will be here uh, circulating, mutating in different waves, literally for the rest of our lives. We cannot live with damaging restrictions for the rest of our lives. We have to learn to live with COVID. We have to get on with our lives. That's what we've done here in Alberta. And that's what those European countries have done as well and uh, they have not brought in additional restrictions to deal with this less severe variant because of the high levels of population protection. Um, and and uh, we have every reason to believe that we'll have a similar experience here in Alberta. Go ahead with your follow-up. Thank you. And on the, uh, yeah, on the topic of lifting restrictions, uh, the plan for phase three, I'm wondering if you have any insight when we might reach that point, uh, what, what it will take uh, with this current situation of the, the wastewater data rising, yeah. and if the province is committing to continue funding wastewater testing in Alberta. Yes, absolutely. We think the wastewater testing is a, a great early warning uh, data point for us to track the uh, virus in Alberta, and so 100% will continue to fund that at, for the indefinite future. Uh, on uh, w stage three of reopening, um, we wanted to take at least three weeks following phase three, uh, two. We've done that. We'll continue to monitor it, 
because we, we can expect a forthcoming wave, I, I don't anticipate we'd be rushing to eliminate the few remaining restrictions. And, and just to categorize those, those are basically restrictions around um, the operation of hospitals, healthcare facilities, uh, continuing care facilities, uh, and the masking requirement, for example, in um, mass transit hospitals and continuing care. So those are relatively modest and, and sensible restrictions that focus on the most vulnerable, and uh, those will stay in place for the indefinite future. We have no immediate plan to lift those. Thank you. Operator, can you please put through our last caller? Isabel Eid, Radio Canada. Bonjour, Monsieur Kenny. Oui. J'aurais deux questions pour vous en français. Oui, certainement. Allez-vous. Comment le gouvernement va s'assurer que les stations essence offrent le rabais aux consommateurs? OK. Tout d'abord, aujourd'hui, les Albertains ont profité d'une euh, élimination de taxes sur l'essence euh, du gouvernement provincial, qui est une euh, épargne de 13 euh, sous euh, par litre et qui représente euh, au, niveau annu au plan annuel une épargne de 1,4 milliard de dollars, c'est très important. Malheureusement, nous avons vu en même temps une augmentation du euh, taxe sur le carbone du gouvernement fédéral. Mais on va surveiller de près euh, les, les prix pour les consommateurs. Aujourd'hui, nous voyons une diminution euh, importante des prix, par exemple, à moyen en Alberta. Hier soir, le prix était... Um, 175, aujourd'hui c'est 154. Alors, on a vécu déjà une diminution d'environ 11 sous par litre et uh, on va surveiller la situation. Mais en même temps, nous avons vu en Ontario une augmentation de 6 sous par litre. Uh, alors, nous, pou nous pouvons voir la différence d'une diminution de taxes provinciales. Go ahead with your follow-up. La, euh, ma deuxième question porte sur euh, Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith veut, remplacer, veut vous remplacer comme euh, chef du Parti conservateur. Comment réagissez-vous au fait que deux ex-chefs du Parti White Rose reviennent en politique avec le but avoué de, de prendre votre place? Voilà. Moi, je vais mettre l'accent sur euh, la protection des Albertains, la croissance économique. De, de bâtir une province forte et d'aider les gens avec le coût de vie comme nous, nous faisons aujourd'hui. Ce n'est pas avec les jeux politiques. Puis euh, je dirais que les militants du Parti conservateur auront l'occasion euh, de voter sur euh, mon leadership en mois d'avril et j'ai hâte à voir les résultats. Moi, j'ai beaucoup de confiance euh, parce que dans les dernières semaines, j'ai voyagé partout en, en, dans la province et j'ai j'ai reçu l'encouragement le, profond de, de membres du Parti conservateur, mais à la, en bout de ligne, ça c'est pour eux à décider s'ils veulent continuer avec un parti unifié et responsable euh, qui, euh, qui va continuer de, de, de donner le leadership responsable aux, à l'Alberta. Merci. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody.